say what I'm going to try to do here today for you. Um, and I'm assuming, I know there's some general folks in here, and I think it's going to work fine. But I'm, this is um, uh, for the clinicians in the audience and the researchers in the audience uh, is the primary focus here. What I'm trying to do in this talk is talk about what's changed in the world of uh, evidence-based psychotherapy and where the f act fits in that, where I think it's going. And then I'm going to try to dive into the model that's underneath ACT uh, of psychological flexibility and show why it's important. And then I have entirely too many uh, slides of data of different forms, and I'll see how long I torture you on that. I was taking advantage of the fact that uh, I normally are given an hour and then they're moving me out and I've got a little more time here. So uh, I'm even going to try to talk a little bit about what's underneath the psychological flexibility model, which is relational frame theory. And uh, long run, I think it's the most important part of the work that I do. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll see if I can do it in a way that doesn't uh, cause a massive uh, 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 noise of uh, heads hitting their chairs in front of them as people fall asleep. I'll try to do it in a way that actually seems uh, relevant. So that's what I'm up to for today. If you work in applied agencies in the U.S. and around the world, you know that evidence-based care is becoming more and more of an issue. That's not going to slow down. It's only going to increase. This is built into the logic of modern civilization. If people are asking for science to be linked to practice. Uh, but we have been through one era, and that's now really changing. We uh, are in an era now with, uh, where evidence is important, but the way that we are going to get there, uh, have lost faith in it. The feds have lost faith in it. The era that we went through was that we thought we would uh, move science into practice in the area of, of uh, mental health problems uh, by categorizing people in terms of their signs and symptoms and then uh, trying to target them. And it did lead to a kind of knowledge growth, not necessarily the kind we thought we needed, like larger and larger books with more and more syndromes and sub-syndromes. I actually have literally done the math, and by 2060, there will be more sub-syndromes in the DSM than there are people in the United States. Uh, and really, that is not a joke. I mean, the thing just can't stop. Because what it's trying to do is to put people into little cubby holes of topography in the hopes that that would un help us find the underlying etiology course response to treatment. What are the functional processes? Well, in physical medicine, that sometimes worked. And it sometimes hasn't. When does it work? It's worked when the signs and symptoms, the things you see and people complain about, are linked to a small set of functional processes. But if you have a small set of functional processes that lead to many manifestations or a wide range of processes that lead to few manifestations, it's failed. Cancer, for example. We botanized cancer for 25, 30 years, everybody who discovered a new little form got the wiggly diggly syndrome or something named after them. And it didn't leave anywhere until we got back in the lab and figured out what, how oncogenes worked and things like that. And so when it's failed, you have to do something different. Uh, the other thing that we've linked this vision to is a large number of uh, evidence-based uh, treatments. This is the, uh, the uh, Division 12 list of those that are evidence-based. And I'm really, really, really happy that ACT is the first four slots. <laughs> it's at the top because it's the best. <laughs> it's actually at the top because its acceptance ACC is enough to put it alphabetically at the top. We thought of naming it AAA therapy, but it seemed cheesy. <laughs> uh, and, but, you know, no human being can learn that list. It's impossible. There are, no system of care can implement that list. It's impossible. Uh, there are things on there that take six months or 12 months to get the certificate. By the way, in ACT, we've eschewed that from the beginning. No certificates. No hierarchy. You know, if you want to be good at ACT, we will give you the tools how to do it. We will give you tests to show that you're competent at it, but no, no anointing. Because getting license means you can take license. And, I want us to constantly feel as though we need to learn more, not that we've been anointed. And uh, it's worked us, we're one of, I think, one of the only approaches out there 
that has, we have recognized trainers, but recognized trainers pay no money and it's peer review. No money ever exchanges hands other than $80 to fire the paperwork, which is less than half of what it costs for us just to handle the paperwork. Yeah, because, you know, what we've been through is this idea that we're gonna protect these territories. No, we should release knowledge out into the world and let's see where it can go with it. And the feds have realized that and now what they're trying to do, NIMH, which 35 years ago, Jerry Clarman said, you're not gonna get any money unless you genuflect in front of the DSM uh, system. And now Tom Insel, and it's being carried on by, uh, now that it's changed hands, has said, I tell you what, if you genuflect in front of the DSM and wanna do a randomized trial for a new method, you're not gonna get any money from us. People don't realize that. They still think in systems of care, oh, DSM, no. But when the feds say no, that means no, because all the researchers line up behind the feds because that's where they get their money. And so if you're not used to rethinking evidence-based care and you're out in the front lines, you need to because the seed corn of what you're learning is what the feds are supporting. And what they're saying is now, we're gonna go after processes. They want mechanisms and processes and moderators and mediators. And I'll explain what those things are when try to do it in a way that won't make your eyes cross. But, you know, and we're gonna do it by positive and negative motivational systems cognitive systems, social systems. The problem with that, that list is only a list of formal areas in which you might find functional processes. Those aren't functional either. They're just saying, we're gonna go after processes, but really in their hearts of hearts, because NIMH is mostly controlled by psychiatry, what they, and a particular wing, they, although they say they're interested in social processes, blah, 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 what they really mean is brain circuits. What they really mean is brain systems. Well, good luck with that. The brain is a very important part of our body, but it's still not a functional model. And I think, uh, you know, we only really have had a history of finding brain processes that really work when we have good guidance from psychology about where to look. Otherwise, you just see pretty pictures of brains lighting up. So far, they've put five years of effort into it. There's not one brain circuit that they've determined that leads to uh, uh, pathological outcomes where they can use it clinically. Okay, so I'm gonna try to take the spirit of this that's in the ACT tradition and try to give it to you in a different way. And the reason I can is that we've worked on it for a long time. Underneath ACT uh, is a, a model, the psychological flexibility model. And, it, and it's part of a commitment to a process-based focus. I'm known for the third wave, Lonnie mentioned it when she uh, came up just because I was the first person to use the term, when I saw what was happening in uh, the behavioral and cognitive therapies as acceptance, mindfulness, and uh, uh, values work uh, swept in. Uh, but the third wave was never really just about acceptance, mindfulness, and values. It was about a shift to process-based therapy. But what I mean by process-based therapies, instead of evidence-based processes link uh, 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 evidence-based protocols for syndromes, we're gonna have evidence-based processes linked to evidence-based procedures that alleviate the problems and promote the prosperity of people. And if you can figure out a way to get more P words in there at sentence, please let me know, I'm working on it. Uh, there's a few words in there, I'd ameliorate, I need a P word for that. Well, and what that would allow us to do then is is to focus on processes that are measurable and changeable, that will mediate, become functionally important into uh, outcomes, and it will lead us to find components that we can fit to people. In other words, it's, it's an old-fashioned vision. It's functional analysis. It's being able to look at a person and see functionally what's going on and target their needs to meet their goals. Clinicians gravitate to that because they understand individuals are individuals. In the DSM era, we had to live with times where you had 65, 70% of, uh, you know, uh, if you had one disorder, you know, comorbidity, you have another disorder, that's not comorbidity, that's a bad diagnostic system. And we're gonna need to move to a system that allows us to fit processes and procedures to the needs of people. And that's what I said, you know, when um, people got on me hard about, I got some pushback on the third wave, 
it actually happened, it came in. It was like the tide, you can stand at the front and say, no, thou, thou shalt not come in. But the folks who screamed and yelled about the third wave, soon enough were doing randomized trials and yoga and <laughs> meeting with the Dalai Lama. I mean, it just happened. So, uh, but what, was, uh, what it was about wasn't just sort of bringing these Eastern ideas in or something. It was about this, an empirical principle. This is a quote from the article where that term was first used, uh, the third wave principle-focused approach that's uh, sensitive to the context and functions of psychological phenomena, not just their form. Uh, and that, by the way, applies uh, to clinicians as well as clients in constructing broad and flexible and effective repertoires. Well, what that would allow us to do is to have something where we can target these processes linked to procedures and build out what our clients need. It's the equivalent of having bricks instead of named architectural designs uh, that you have to do no matter what. Now my journey starts really inside my own panic disorder. Uh, I was a trained behavior therapist, early cognitive behavior therapist, trained behavior analyst. Uh, but when panic brought me to the point where I couldn't give a talk to five undergraduates without almost falling down, uh, it forced me to challenge some of my basic underlying assumptions about human beings and how they worked. This is a picture of me, my first uh, TEDx talk of hitting bottom, uh, a moment when I, when I turned, where uh, after a three-year spiral down into my life getting smaller and smaller by doing the logical, reasonable, sensible, pathological things uh, that lead to panic disorder, uh, where I thought I had a heart attack in the, at, uh, at the bottom of this spiral down, and then realized at two in the morning that I'm, no, I'm not going to the emergency room because this is not a heart attack, it's just another panic attack. And I couldn't even trust my own body to give me uh, feedback that's proper. This, the, the, I call that the scream, because I gave that scream once when I was caught in a machine, that uh, moment on the shag, uh, brown and gold shag carpet where I turn on the voices within and say, no more, I'm not giving you any more, you're not gonna make me run from me. And, uh, and then that TEDx talk, I'm never gonna do it again. Three times, that's enough. Uh, you can actually hear the scream if you go to the TEDx talk. But the reason I mention it is, the act works is grounded inside human complexity. Let's start with facing up to this goofy idea that People with problems are them, and we up here in our you know, clinical grandness are gonna help them get normal. You know, go look in the freaking mirror. <laughs> the divorce rate among the clinicians in this group is higher, higher as it is out there. The rates of anxiety, depression, higher, higher here as it is out there. So who are we to be doing that? You know, let's ground our work in the reality of being hum a human being. And so that is mentioned because it's part of the spirit of the work. We've had a, a central question inside the ACT community, the contextual behavioral science community, we call it, which is basically, why is it so hard to be human? What's up with that? And we'll accept no answer that minimizes, objectifies, and dehumanizes. Oh, it's just, I don't want to hear the rest of the sentence. If you can say, it's just, I don't want to hear the rest of the sentence. <coughs> Human complexity is more than that. Now, you underst you'll understand a little bit of psychological flexibility if I do a flicker fusion version of evolution science, because really it's a form of it. Uh, not genetic causation and all of that. That's, that's old-fashioned evolution science that's been brought down now that the human genome is fully mapped and we know that it's basically false. Uh, but I just want to give you those concepts in your head so when you see psychological flexibility, you can think about this as just another way of thinking about how systems evolve. Cultures evolve, behavioral patterns evolve, genes, epigenes evolve, and the, they do that around three concepts. One is variation. If you don't, can't do this, something different, you can't change. If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got. That's Mom's Mabley's wisdom, and it's right. Uh, what are the processes that are variation are a big focus of our work. 
you've got to be able to select the variants that are, that are helpful. You've got to be able to notice what's working and what isn't and be humble in being guided towards what works rather than what your mind might say works. And you got, you're gonna retain it in the world of psychology. You retain by doing. You don't use it, you lose it. And so building out habits and patterns of action will be critical. If we're gonna evolve on purpose, we need to be focusing on context though. Really, what are the variations? And when you're working clinically with somebody, not encouraging them to do things that are beyond themselves, keeping it small, but keeping things that would actually fit and be supported in their homes, in their, um, given their repertoire, given what they're doing, given what their purposes are. You gotta pick out the dimensions that are important. It isn't just the ones that are on a list of uh, symptoms, effects, it's predominantly not that. That might include things like emotional openness or might include things like sleep or working on nutrition or exercise, even though the person came into you for depression. You can't just be thinking, you gotta let this DSM era go, just let it go. Because depression is one whole human being living a life. And you need to focus out more broadly on all the dimensions that's gonna affect that, including things like social support like what's going on in terms of their sex life, in terms of the amount of sleep that they get, et cetera, and, and assume that as part of your role. And if you don't feel competent to do it, because I don't know about that, you need to learn about that. Because one whole human being has all these different dimensions. You know that in your personal life, you have to put that in your professional life. If you can't do it only with yourself, you can't be expert in everything, build out your clinics and your agencies in which way, hello, that there's the experts there that can help you on it. And then you have to be thinking at multiple levels. I work with uh, David Sloan Wilson, an internationally known evolutionary biologist, and we have a book coming out together. We have projects, a major paper uh, in behavioral brain science linking our work to evolution science. He was the one who sort of dragged a multi-level selection back into evolution science when it had become almost a joke. Uh, you couldn't take a course in evolution without saying group level selection used to be believed in, but now it's wrong. That's not true. It's actually the, the tide has turned and it'll be important to my story about uh, RFT, but it's important clinically in this way, that you have to be thinking about the nestedness of life. That the individual isn't just the individual, the individual's in a, a relationship, but it's not just the relationship, they're in a larger family, but it's not just that, they're in a work organization, but it's not just that, they're part of a larger kind of social fabric and they're part of a religious community and they're part of, and it's the same thing all the way down. You're not just an individual, you're 37 trillion cells. You're all different kinds of repertoires and voices. Your mama's inside you, your dad's inside you, your spouse is inside you. And certain parts of these are kind of competing. And so multi-level selection says basically that the way that you get peace and cooperation is for the smaller units to succeed by being part of larger units that succeeds. And if you're not thinking that way, you can easily get too narrowly focused. That's part of what psychopathology is. It's the selfishness of the parts of us trying to claim the whole of us. Um, and that, so just file it away that selection operates at multiple levels and to, to get cooperation, we need to find ways for the smaller units to succeed at the same time as the larger units succeed. succeed. Okay, so what are the biggest enemies of healthy variation and selective retention? Just that part. Well, this is where we start after my moment on the brown gold shide carpet in 1981. Within a few months, I'm asking that question. Basically, why is it so hard to be human? Why is it so hard to be me? But really looking as a behavior analyst and the person sort of sensitive to these kind of evolutionary ideas, what are the, why, why, did I allow myself to get narrowed down into this tiny little box of I can't feel anxious. Well, what are the big enemies of variation? One is avoidance. We know that even from animal models. If you run away from the stimuli that could evoke new forms of behavior, you're not gonna see new forms of behavior. Uh, you know, the old joke of, you know, why do you have your banana in your ear? Keeps the elephants away. There's no elephants here. See, it works. You know, and so we see rigidity and avoidance because it, it will be almost self-sustaining once it begins. That's true in animal models, it's true in humans. 
humans have something else, and I'm gonna do kind of a deep dive, in, not deep dive, a little dive into this when I'm trying to do my RFT wrap, but we have this tremendously wonderful uh, variation producing thing called human language that produces variation in everything except for things that can't be done in a particular form of human language. So we, on the one hand, we've got this huge amount of variation that exploded when we learned how to talk and listen the way that we did, when we learned the tool of symbolic thought. I'm gonna talk about that in a second, where, where that came from. But what it then did is it restricted variation outside of that. We're the figure outers, the problem solvers, the rule followers. We're talking to ourselves constantly about, well, if I did this, I get this, and that's better than that. And so, and you, yeah, but how about things that don't get learned that way? If any of you know about dancing, music, sports, you know your mind gets in the way. I mean, you can't play a fast piece and think about it. As soon as you do, you're making mistakes. Yogi Berra, you know, don't think, just hit. You know, you gotta take inner tennis lessons. I mean, you've gotta to go to mindfulness treats just to like do normal things that every other creature on the planet can do because they don't have the language monster constantly getting in the way. Excessive rule following, I'm after, you take something like OCD. I mean, it's incredibly rational. Incredible. I, I could poison my children by touching something that had germs and fix it. I could. You can't say that's not <laughs> rational. It's just insane. But you know, the insanity of overextending one part of us, this is multi-level selection, this is selfishness, this is one part of us claiming the whole of us and learning how to have the whole of us work together in a cooperative way. Well, so I did early work, my lab did early work showing that if you gave someone a rule, you could make them quickly, you know, have the intelligence level of a cockroach. I mean, if you bring people into an environment where they say they have to work hard to achieve outcomes and then you change it so that all they need to do is wait for a while and do a little bit to achieve the same outcomes, like you put, behavioral geek language, you put them on a high variable ratio schedule and then flip them down to a, a matched variable interval schedule. Every creature on the planet, working really hard, working really hard to change the contingencies and they slow down, except one. We're still working hard. You bring them in the lab, you know, you can even set it up so that you won't get anything unless you finally stop for a long time, right? Uh, you know, I used to work, I used to work, and finally they're exhausted. <sighs> That's a stop. They don't know that. <sighs> they start again. <laughs> Payoff. <gasps> <sighs> now, you know about this. I'll give you an example. Uh, I'll do it in... In, in, in a gender-focused uh, way, because this is the way that I learned it. Men don't know how to shut up about, how to, about talking to their wives about things. They tend to want to explain. Uh, they think kind of in a, well, I know this is gender bias, but so I'm hearing the thing where, you know, I'm feeling like it's unfair. My wife's criticizing me about something, and I just want to explain why uh, really what I did was okay, right? Anybody watching this train wreck would know what I need to do. It's called shut up. <laughs> but I just have to explain what you <laughs> It's like really hard to learn things like there's times just not to do. And we can see it in this excessive kind of rule following. In that case, these issues of fairness and understanding will overwhelm me, even though my experience says, no, I should just sit inside discomfort and listen to my wife. And by the way, usually she's right. Uh, it takes a little while to realize it. I have to shut up to hear it. You put these things together, you put together rule following and avoidance, and boy, now you've got a system for pathology but this is absolutely normal. We do this thing of don't go there, you've been hurt before. If you're betrayed in a relationship, the next time somebody gets under your skin and begins to break down your defenses, you feel almost like, whoa, and you find yourself doing things like not answering the phone or deliberately doing an argument or, you know what I'm talking about? I'm not gonna let him get close to me, he might hurt me. Well, people can hurt you when you're close. But you're following a rule linked to controlling your emotions, and it, you know, can, it's hard to rein that in. 
So what are these verbal rules anyway? These uh, Wizard of Oz voices in our heads that are commanding us to seek the uh, broomstick of the Wicked Witch of the West or avoid our difficult thoughts and feelings. This is where I want to do a little bit into relational frame theory. Um, okay, here, here's a different way. Let's see if this will work because relational frame theory is very hard to talk about. It's hard to language about language. But it's, it's an important thing that's underneath psychological flexibility. I believe that what we're doing right now is something that's probably a couple hundred thousand years old. That's the, how long Homo sapiens have been around. Based on whether or not you think the hominids did it, it might be a couple million years old. It's no more than that. Why? Because the language trained chimps don't do what your 12 month old baby will do that I'm about to show you is critical to being able ever to do what you and I are doing right now. It's evolutionarily new. Operant and classical conditioning, how we learn by experience, habituation a little bit, but it's mostly contingency learning, operant and classical conditioning, is 545 million years old. It's half a billion years old. How do we know that? Every organism that evolved since the Cambrian period does it, and every organism before that doesn't do it. So these are ancient, ancient, ancient systems to learn the way Pavlov's dogs did or Skinner's uh, or rats and pigeons. And we've been trying to figure out language and cognition for 300 years by making the concept of association work. Well, association comes by temporal contiguity, physical contiguity, or formal similarity. It looks the same, so you get generalization. They occurred together in the same time and space. That dog will not hunt. It has never been able to step up to the challenge even of understanding just how a few words work, how a sentence works. And I'm gonna try to show you why. But what's really going on, what we really came up with, is not this tinker toy connection associative stuff. That's not what we're doing. What we're really doing when we're speaking is something more like this picture. And it's not just a loose metaphor, it's actually where it came from. Let me explain, I'll explain what I, what I mean. So, if you looked at, suppose I tell you all these people are related. In fact, they are, it's a big family. You've got people of different races there, different ages and genders, right? How are they all related? looking at what they look like. You can't tell. If I told you where they lived, could you tell? Not necessarily, you'd have some indications. How about their age? You still can't tell. After all, little Susie, who's only four, might be the aunt of, uh, of Joey, uh, who's uh, 10 years old or 15 or 20. Fred might be married to George. Uh, by marriage, etc. all these different races can combine. It could be that the two people who live together in San Diego are distant cousins, but the person who lives in Washington, D.C. and Chicago, they have a long distance marriage. Associative learning, similarity, temporal and physical contiguity won't explain this. It's a, but if you knew how who these people were, you could tell me all their relationships, every single one. It might take you a little while. This one's a niece of that, that's a second cousin of that, that person's married to that, right? You could do that, right? And if you knew a relationship between this person to that, you'd know that person to this, right? Into a vast network. That's what language is doing. Language is like a family relationship picture. Uh, now, I'm gonna try to make that real and show that that's not a loose metaphor. That's actually how it happened, I believe. And it changes how we think of the problem we face in reining in the voice within. It's worth a deep dive. And in addition, it's worth it because there's really cool things you can do when you have an understanding of language beyond even psychotherapy. I mean, we can do with what I'm about to tell you, things like raise people's IQs by 15 points in about six months. We can take autistic spectrum disordered kids who don't have a sense of self and establish it. We can do implicit measures of cognition that are orders of magnitude better than anything that you've heard about, like the IAT, et cetera. So you can do cool things with language. You can vet the stimuli and roll out of Obamacare, which we did in Nevada, and figure out how to reach people and persuade them in the first 300 milliseconds when they saw an ad. So I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm, gonna talk, I'm talking about therapy. 
But a reason I'm talking about this is it makes a difference to think about the challenge of language that is leading to these weird things like a relatively successful assistant professor unable to talk to five undergraduates. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's the little seed. If you don't do this, you don't develop human language. If that little one knew that that round thing was called an apple, and then I asked for the apple, the toddler, the baby would look for and try to give me the apple. We're the only creatures that do that. You can get that, something that looks like that by training it in both directions, but we're the only one that we learn it in one direction and we show it in the other direction. Not at first. When you're dealing with a 12 month old or a nine month old, you know, this is Dada. They have to learn that relation, but as they have different examples of also, where's Dada? <gasps> There's Dada. Eventually, you could say, uh, uh, you could establish something that's an, totally uh, new. Now, why, why would that be? Let me just hang on to that. If you don't fully understand, but hang on to that. We're by far the most cooperative primates, by far. Jane Goodall never saw a case where two chimpanzees were trying to move a log and one picked up one end and the other picked up the other end. I mean, there's plenty of cooperation out there in the animal kingdom, I don't mean that, but we are the super cooperators, the ultra cooperators, toddlers trying to move a log will pick up one end and the other end. Infants, this is a little baby, this is an actual picture, so you can't see it, but there's Honey Nut Cheerios on her high chair tray, okay? She's watching a mean puppet and a nice puppet interact, okay? This is pre-verbal. Now the puppets come over and they want a treat. She'll feed her precious Honey Nut Cheerios to the nice puppet. She won't feed it to the mean puppet. <laughs> you recognize cooperation and you'll reward it in others before language, that's how basic it is. That's the kind of monkey we are. Here's another one. Another, pre-verbal babies playing with toys. And then it's clean up time, clean up time. You're down and you're taking the toys and you're putting them in a box and you point to a toy that's out of reach and the baby reaches for it and gets the toy and looks at you and tries to put it in the box. Understanding, that's what we're doing. Now, in that same scenario, while they're cleaning up, here comes a new adult, gets down, points at a toy out of reach. What does the baby do? Reaches for it, picks it up, and tries to give it to the adult. Babies understand intentionality. There's basic theory of mind skills. From the perspective of a new adult coming in, it's not cleanup time. He must want the toy, okay? If you just take those two, two kinds of things and then you did something like this, would you, would you mind playing with me a little bit? Would you play? Okay, I want you to make a sound. Make a sound, any sound. Mm. Mm. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Of course you do that. Of course you do that, right? Well, lots and lots of animals will emit characteristic sounds or things when they see things. Chimps will squeak in a particular way when a snake shows up. Prairie dogs when the eagle's coming, right? But when you flip it around the other way, if you go, uh, you know, if you learn snake sound, that doesn't mean sound snake. It doesn't go in the other direction. In humans it does, and the same areas of the brain light up. We're the only ones that are like that. Why? Well, socially, before there's language, if you knew that this had a name, and then we're the super cooperators, and we'll even reinforce cooperation, why wouldn't you do this? If, if we had a name for Apple, Pre-verbal, so we not, we're not yet a verbal troop, but we just had a sound, just like chimps do for snakes, but we had it for apples, and you're on the other side of a ravine, and I could go, apple, why wouldn't you do what you just did? But once we do that, 
In other words, once we get, you see what I mean by relationships? Once we get it in a social relationship, there's a speaker and the listener are in a pair, a cooperative pair, and language can be used to extend cooperation, which is where I think it started. Once you're doing that, you've got this core idea of you learn it in one, you derive it in two. You don't have to be taught the listener role, but as that becomes internalized inside the same skin, I could go, hmm, then hmm. And mentally, this is now being brought to mind. You, you see what I'm saying? The core skill of learn it in one, derive it in two, children who don't develop that will never develop normal human language. If you don't derive that without having it to be trained like a parrot or like the chimpanzees or your dog. And by the way, don't send me emails about your smart dog. I know it's smart, but they didn't learn it. They learned it both directions. Yes, they can get your slippers. You trained them too. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about learn it for the first time. And now I can say, what does a hmm look like? You can picture it, right? You didn't get trained to do that. Nobody rewarded you for that. It's just built in. All right, so here's my argument. It's, this is the, the, you know, when I'm dead and buried, which won't be very long from now, at my age, I think this is gonna be more important than ACT or CBS or any of the stuff that I've done. Because if this claim is right, and it appears as though now, 30 years in and almost 300 studies that it is right, or at least partially right, all scientific theories are wrong, but, you know, but at least partially right, is that here's the deal. Language is not association. It's learned relation. And associations are one direction, they're not two. When you hear, you know, Pavlov's dogs went, bell food, bell food, then you don't go give the dog outpo and it goes, what? It goes in one direction, not two. If I see the lion, I run to the thicket. That doesn't mean if I see the thicket, I run to the lion. If I do that, I'm one dead monkey. It doesn't go in two, language does. Because relationships go in two. If I'm your uncle, you know, you're my niece. And so, uh, Here's a little ditty that summarizes 30 years of work on relational frame theory. This is what human language is. Learn it in one, derive it in two, put it in networks that change what you do. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's kind of silly that 30 years of work leads to that, but that's, that's what it is. All right, but it extends out. It starts out with just naming, but it extends out in other ways. If you have a three-year-old, you know that the three-year-old wants the nickel rather than the dime. They know that coins can be used to buy cool th stuff and they want the big one. Well, if you've got a five-year-old, they begin to want the dime over the nickel. It becomes arbitrary. Hmm, in this relationship, there's nothing about hmm that goes with this other than it came out of her mouth, yeah? So it's not similarity, it's not contiguity, it's not time going together, it's relationship. But that extends now to other relationships, not just is, but isn't, and opposite, and comparatives. So I can say, just by social convention, a dime is bigger than a nickel. Well, it isn't. It's smaller. No, but I, it is, because we decided. That's the relationship. It's just like aunt, I mean, uncle and, and niece. Well, once you do that, you can derive now that a, you know, if, if a, a nickel is smaller, a dime is bigger, and if you use nickels to buy candy, now you want the dime, even if you've never spent dimes before. That sounds wonderful, doesn't it? In terms of solving problems, it is. But here's a problem. Let's just take this. I now have words that are bidirectionally related to concepts. They're no longer bound by form, and it can be any kind of relationship. Are you up to speed with me? It kinda, I know it's a little vague about the details, but believe me, the RFTers have worked this out with, in excruciating detail. You can't even read the damn studies. You know, the relational frame theory book, I can't read and I wrote it. I mean, it is hard, the language about language. But just that level of understanding. How about this? If it's arbitrary, I can do something like, no matter how successful I've been, I should have been so much more. It's arbitrary. I can do that. And if I can do that, I can be miserable amongst any amount of success. 
All I need is the cognitive capacity to picture something that's even grander and more wonderful and compare, right? That's exactly what we do. I mean, you have depressed people coming to see you and you go like, man, this dude has everything. Yeah, but they've also got the language monster. They can tell them they don't have anything, even amidst that. And that means that we can't challenge it just rationally. We can't challenge it just formally. We can't challenge it just by solving the problem. We've got the capacity to carry our painful experiences everywhere we go. If you can see the hmm, and you've had a traumatic event, you can bring it to mind anywhere. You can be in this magnificent room with these incredible lights this, and bring it to mind. You know, and, I, and, it will, and it will build out because learn it one, drive it in two, put it in networks, things that relate to it. So, for example, um, when I was struggling with my panic uh, uh, disorder, I, you know, started trying to do things like listen to relaxation tapes. Because if I got relaxed, then I would be nervous because, see, it's, there's a reciprocal inhibition. This is back in the days, so right? Systematic desensitization. So exposure plus reciprocal inhibition. So what I need, I'll do my relaxation tape, and when I really, really relax, then that'll fight down the anxiety monster. And so, okay, it's, it's working. It's working. I'm feeling a lot better. Ah, I'm relaxed. I'm, I'm giving a talk to my undergraduates. I'm, I'm doing better, and I'm relaxed, and that's good, because uh, otherwise I'd be anxious, you know, and, I'm, I and if I were anxious, that would be bad, because I'm, but what was that? Uh, so the, I'm losing my track on the lecture, but my heart just jumped a little bit, but I'm, I'm relaxed. How far away is the door? It may, maybe I should give my lecture over here, but I'm feeling, I'm not, I'm not feeling relaxed. I'm feeling, in fact, I'm feeling anything but relaxed. I'm feeling really anxious. <laughs> Anybody here work with anxiety disorders and know about the phenomenon of relaxation-induced panic? It's an empirical phenomenon. Go look it up in the literature. The attempt to be relaxed will induce panic attacks. <laughs> you just saw it. I just did a short form of what I lived through. Of course it does. Look, any relationship, it isn't just is, it isn't an opposite, etc. Okay, let's just see. Um, how about if I do this? Hot. Okay, black. Relaxed. Yeah. Do you see it? You can't even deal with anxiety by the opposite of anxiety, because opposite is relation. It'll remind you of anxiety. Do you see it? You know, this is what's going on in OCD, et cetera. And this, this network just is keep growing and growing and growing and growing. So uh, it isn't just if you've had an accident, let's say, don't think about the cars. It could also be don't think about not thinking about cars. I mean, this is a hell of a situation. By the time I was at the bottom, you know, being on the shag carpet at two in the morning, if you said the word relaxation, I'd get nervous. If you said anxiety, I'd get nervous. If you said emotion, I'd get nervous. If you talked about your body, I'd get nervous. It was pretty darn hard to do clinical work because all roads lead to Rome. And that's exactly what you see in the extension of these clinical problems. And of course we would do this. You can bring this problem-solving mode of mind to anything, and of course we would say, I should try to get rid of that feeling. Okay, so why does this matter? Uh, you've indulged me because of the longer time frame. I've had a little more play time with RFT than I usually do in front of a group of clinicians. I hope I can make it relevant. But are you kind of with me? All right, here's a few implications. Although it started as a sweet extension of cooperation. Apples, apples. You know, just like giving the Honey Nut Cheerios to the cooperative puppet. It then evolved as new relationships came in into a problem solving tool. Because I can think about the hmm. I can think about whether or not the hmm is better than the uh. I can imagine what I could do to get the hmm and it loses contact with form, the nickel-dime situation. 
As it does that, uh, when you realize that cognitive relations are learned and there is no process called unlearning, there is no process called unlearning, right? Psychology 102 or whatever. <laughs> There's extinction, that's inhibition. You can extinguish it all the way down to zero levels, you can reacquire it more rapidly. That means it's still there. And as new behaviors get confronted and it goes, you'll go way back to the earliest parts of your repertoire. The example I usually give is in 9-11, I am certain there were people up in that building calling for their mama before they fell down or burned to death or leapt out the window. I'm certain of that. Of course they did. Because that's the kind of creature that we are. Once you've learned it, it's there forever. There's no delete button in the nervous system. There's no minus button. It doesn't exist. So if you've ever made a connection, that connection is there to be made more easily. And it's broken free of form. So you can't solve it. You can't solve the misery of a person simply by, you know, dumping goodies on top of them. You can win the freaking lottery if you're depressed and be even more depressed. Um, but problem solving does have a positive role in figuring out how to foster ends that are rule governed. So, and it, unfortunately, it's hard to formulate a simple rule for when we should use rules. This repertoire doesn't know when to stop. Look, it'll tell you, I did a public talk here and I tried to get somebody to tell me how to walk and they told me things like move your foot and I'd say how and they'd say, well, just do it. And then I'd say, well, how do you do that? And you know, you only get about three or four steps in before you got to, I don't know. So we're living inside this system that says that it knows everything and it knows only a little thing. It knows how to generate and follow rules. How do we get other things into the room for our clients? We're gonna have to put that freaking mind of ours on a leash and use it when it's good. It's massively good in so many areas. We're in this wonderful room because of it. If it wasn't, we'd be a whole bunch of folks sitting out in the middle of a field, naked. But it doesn't work for everything. And we are the folks who work on the places where it doesn't work. It's called mental health for a reason. They're called mental problems for a reason. Now what we've developed out of this sensitivity to really digging into the basics all the way down to try to figure out how language works. I mean, my poor clinical students, they were clinical students who created RFT. These are not basic experimentalists. They did what we called the basic slide. We just kept asking questions. What's a rule? And it came down, oh, it's, Behavior governed by a verbal stimulus. What's verbal? What's a verbal stimulus? We ended up with these clinical students. Here would be the lab question. What's a word? I mean, but we just wouldn't stop until we got an answer that worked. And that gives me a foundation to stand in front of you and say, this work is kind of different than other things that are out there. I'm sorry for the self-praise, but it's just different because we insisted on processes that would explain it. And so when I, now that we're headed into the era of process-oriented therapy, process-based therapy, which is what's gonna happen, which is what is happening, I can stand here and say, we've got a small set of processes that do a lot of things, and they're standing on a firm foundation that you don't need to know about, but you can if you're interested in it, even all the way down to how do basic behavioral principles and our underlying biology link to these cognitive principles that emerge somewhere in between the last 200,000 and 2 million years. That's cool. Uh, and I think it's worth uh, some attention. So I, I will walk through the psychological flexibility model, I'll talk a little bit about what we can do with it, and then we'll see how far we go into this uh, uh, excessive amount of time you've given me. Okay, so this is the usual way that we present the psychological flexibility model, uh, in which we are gonna teach diffusion skills and acceptance skills. Diffusion skills, learn it in one, derive it in two, put it in networks that change what you do. If there's no unlearning, if it can be applied arbitrarily, and once you do it, it never leaves your head. You're not gonna solve clinical problems primarily by changing the networks. You can change the flexibility of the networks and you can expand the networks. Learn it in one, derive it in two, put it in networks. You can do that, like psychoeducation. 
Psychoeducation is fine when people have never learned something, when they have never heard something. That's something new in the network, it's fine. Nine times out of 10, it's useless because they already know it. They already read it. It was on Oprah. <laughs> and so what do you do in saying, well, actually, panic won't kill you. <laughs> oh, I never knew that. <laughs> I thought I was gonna fall dead. But, but, but I'm afraid I'm gonna die, I'm afraid I'm gonna die. Yes, I understand it looks like it's an informational problem. I understand that. It's not. It's a transformation problem. Change what you do. And you're not going to be able to manipulate the network by taking things out. You know, if relaxation can mean anxiety, you're not going to get, oh, you're not going to have a heart attack by telling people you're not going to have a heart attack. Or showing them the data on how many people, by the way, occasionally panic does lead to heart attack. I'm sorry to tell you. <laughs> you know, if you get your heart rate going enough, some people are fragile, they do, I'm sorry. You're always afraid if they're going to read that article, you know, oh my God, I've never... You know, you're not going to solve it that way. Sometimes, yes, I'm fine with such good education, but come on. Uh, let's distinguish the kind of problem. But what, now, one thing you can do, even though there's no eraser, there's no delete button, you can change what they do. That's not that hard. Diffusion can do it. And so all of these uh, diffusion skills are putting the cognitive networks into an unusual context so people can see that they have skills as to rein in the transformation of stimulus functions. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. We're reading stories to children. And we're reading stories about being out in a desert and not having any water. And, you, and you're just reading a story. And you start watching the children. They start licking their lips. They start, you know, they're doing things like they're looking for water. If the water's free available, they're drinking it more just by hearing the story. Okay, and then you do a little game, We're not telling them this experimental thing, of course they're not brought in. And so they're saying things like, you know, and so you're out in the desert, and desert spelled almost like dessert. And then you start throwing in weird stuff like this, and, and it's really, it's, they're feeling really bad. But bad spells backwards is dab. And you see what they're doing? They're just goofing with this normal kind of stream you're in. And these, things fall away. The licking of the lips and the drinking of the water, even though the story's still there. If you're looking at the story at the same time you look in the world from inside the story, it changes the impact of the story. Now, you're probably not gonna do that with your clients. You're probably not gonna spell panic backwards. You could. It would probably be fun, actually. It might be actually helpful to them. Never tried that. Hmm. Uh, but you can do things like this. Uh, okay, I'm really bad. Say, well, could we just do something absolutely crazy? Could we just sing that? Like, what's a song that we like? And if they have a rap tune, I've got Spotify, uh, Spotify or, uh, on my thing, and I'll actually put, it's really bad, and then we'll do it to a trance tune or to a, a rap tune. Or if you want to get the sense of it, think of I'm really bad, and now we'll do it to the tune of Happy Birthday. I'm really, really, really bad. I'm really, really, really bad. I'm really, 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 really. I'm really, really, really bad. It's a little different. It's the same, it's a little different. You gotta time these things well with clients. They'll feel that you're invalidating their experience. This is usually a little later on, but I'm trying to give you a taste for it. We'll do word repetition. Titchener came up with it 100 years ago. We'll take a word and we'll just say it over and over again for 30 seconds. Turns out that we've just done recent studies. The pace is one word per second. So if we're doing panic, we'll go panic, 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 at least 30 seconds. There's a, at least a month. It's just that one thing. 30 seconds will last at least a month. Brand new study just came out with self with negative thoughts to still do a word that a negative punch on somebody 30 seconds one person one word per second same word over and over again a di reduction of distress the last a month Isn't that crazy i think it's crazy once you get how diffusion works you can make them up there's hundreds of them like you know putting the word on, i'm really bad on your chest walking around the 
now, how to get that in clinically, if this is new to you and you're going, oh my God, this guy's a lunatic. Um, uh, well, the ACT books will help you with it. But the principle is helping people to, uh, now, here, let's say, I'll do another one kind of uh, uh, clinically. I'm really bad, let's say I'm working with somebody. I say, okay, here, let's write it down on a sheet of paper. Show me how, how close it is. Like, is it like, way out here, I'm really bad, or is it really up here? And very likely it's up like this. I'd say, well, let's just hold it there. Now, what do you see? I say, I'm really bad. Uh, what am I doing? I can't see. I said, yeah, that's part of the problem. Now, you don't know how to delete those words, but what if we could just work on putting those words over here? They're still there. You can see them. They're not going away. They have no place else to go. But now you and I can talk. And they're still there. I'm really bad. I mean, physical metaphors for how to take words and change the, what they do. Uh, and that's a whole set of things that we've done. Now, the mindfulness folks have learned that, I, you know, contemplative practice is a technology to do that. Anybody in here who meditates knows that thoughts show up like, I'm doing a really good job meditating today. <laughs> and you could do with that, what you'd normally do it, it, with negative words, but this flies under the radar screen. Sometimes it's like, I'm really doing a good job meditating today. No, you're not. You're done. But if it was out there, it would be just another thought. It isn't the thought, I'm doing a really good job, that's going to drop you out of you know, the flow. And we've come up with things. I, I, I'm just spending more time than I should, but. OK. Act in contemplative practice. Is act based on Buddhism? No. Uh, hello. But Buddhism and all of the mystical wings of all of the major religions, it's not just a B one, um, have learned ways to do this change what you do, whether it's chanting uh, or silence or koans or they all mess around with literal, logical, analytical problem solving language. Because religion was our first defense right about the time we get written language and we've really turned the language monsters at loose on us uh, was the first major attempt to, 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 uh, uh, to do to kind of kind of do that oh shoot I lost my train of thought what was, where was I going with the uh, I was going to do a diffusion exercise oh yeah so contemplative practice helps you learn to do this but we've come up with things that we think help even more all right, let's, we'll do it as a, a, an exercise together. Helps even more, not as a substitute for compactable practice, but there's something you can put into people's lives in a, in a matter of minutes that'll help them get down to what the pivot point is of change what you do. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to actually do this. This is in the first act book. Uh, and I'll do it the way it was there. It's more popular in another form, but I'll do it this way. What I want you to do, I'm gonna actually ask you to do it as an eyes closed exercise, but don't close your eyes yet. What I'm gonna ask you to do is to notice your thoughts in an ongoing way. And when you have a thought, here's what you're to do. I want you to imagine that you're sitting on a parade stand and there's a parade going down in front of you and people are marching and they're holding little signs like you do when you have a parade sometimes and there's a little placard there. The placards, however, are blank until you put something on them. If you think in images, I want you to put the image on. If you think in words, it's actually even better. Write the words on the plac placard, okay? But now here's the, superficially, here's the purpose of the exercise. Superficially, it's allowing the parade to keep going. Really, the purpose of the exercise, it is to notice what happens when it no longer does that. Because you won't be very far in. I'm only gonna let you go a minute. My guess is at least two thirds of you will have this experience. If I went two, it would be almost universal. You'll hit a place where it starts to stutter or stops, or you're not on the reviewing stand, or you're in the parade, or you went back home and you're wondering if the toaster was left on, or you, you're you know, fixing your lunch for your kid, or you're wondering about your practice, or you're wondering how, is it really two minutes or one minute or how long, or something. You're gone, all right? You'll catch that you're gone. Now, here's what I want you to do when you do that. Back up a few seconds earlier. If you catch it fast, it won't be very long. And catch that there was a thought that showed up that didn't go on a placard. 
You get what I'm, the game I'm asking you to do? I'm asking you to simply to put your thoughts in a continuous stream. If they repeat, just put them there. This is not to make them go away. It's not to do anything. It's just to let your thoughts be placed out there into a physical form. But at the point at which that disappears in your mind and something else is happening, back up. I'm not going to be able to work with you individually. If I was, I could actually ask you to say some things out loud. But and notice what just happened right before it stuttered, stopped, you left it, you're gone, you're in it, you're somewhere else, you're no longer up on the stand watching the parade. You get the game? All right, so close your eyes and this thing's gonna last less than two minutes and we're gonna see where we go. Start out by becoming aware of the present. The only best way to do that is sensation and I want you just to notice what it feels like to sit in this seat that you're sitting in. Notice where your body touches this chair. From the inside out, actually feel that your butt and your back is touching the chair and exactly where it is. And then notice that you're noticing. Your butt didn't notice itself. A whole human being called you noticed your butt was sitting in the chair and your back was touching the chair. Don't grab that part and look at it. This is the part we look from, but just touch for a, sec, for a millisecond that awareness resides. You're holding an awareness. There's a fromness and a nowness and a hereness into which you can put the sensation of the chair. And now what I want you to do is picture that scene in which you're sitting up on a parade stand and there's a road down in front of you. Here comes the parade. And the folks marching in it, all different kind of folks are marching along holding these placards. And I'm gonna be quiet. And any thought that shows up, put it on a placard. But then the real purpose is to notice when it stutters, stops, or you left. And then picture the room and the people that are in it, just for fun, and see if you can remember the color of the curtain that's behind the stage. And when you're ready to come back to that space, open your eyes. Uh, give me a nod if it stuttered, stopped, you wandered, you drove. just give me a nod. If you had, about as I thought, so most of you did. Uh, now, give me, is anybody willing to shout out what you caught? When you caught that you wandered and you came back, could you find a thought that had come up? Give me a nod if that's true. You could find a thought, okay. Anybody willing to share just an example of a thought that came up that hooked you and you're out? Anybody willing to call one out? Vacation. Huh? Vacation. Vacation, you thought of your vacations, okay. Um, and here's, oh, it would take a few more. I'm cold. I'm cold, awesome. Am I doing it right? How many did it? Something having to do with the exercise. This is not working for me. Am I doing it right? How long does this go on? Uh, these never work for me out of whatever. Okay? Uh, those are especially because they fly underneath the radar screen. This is not about the exercise. This is, you know, don't put me on a placard. I just want to explain that this is going on a long time. This doesn't seem like a minute. It's at least two minutes. I think he, is he, he's probably practicing his slides. He should have, why didn't he, whatever. 
<laughs> whatever. Here's the deal. That's fusion. That's fusion. I gave you a purpose. It's a simple freaking purpose. How could it be more simple? Come on. It couldn't be more simple. Put your thoughts on a placard. <coughs> it's only a minute. You can't do it. You can't do it. If I let it go two or three, no one in here, maybe one or two, if you're a meditator, you might, and really, maybe, but almost no one in here. That's how wild this horse is that we're on top of. We can't tell it to do anything. Well, okay, so it snuck in there with something that had a little power, a little emotional bump or that presented itself as innocent. I'm not interrupting the exercise. I'm actually helping you. Are you doing it right? Because you need to think about it if you're doing it right, otherwise you can't do it. So just listen to me. You're gone. You're in another network. That's fusion. Fusion is the domination of verbal, symbolic, now you know from what I said, relational, Learned, relational, arbitrarily applicable. Okay, that's RFT. You, what you did is you, you uh, visited fusion, which is the domination of verbal symbolic stimuli over other forms of behavioral influence in a context in which the purpose of doing it is served by this other form. I'm trying, you know, it's fine to enter into the network when we're just trying to do something in the network. You're trying to figure out how to do your taxes, fuse the hell out of what you're doing because you need to know the rules and just follow the rules and all that. But I gave you a very, very, very simple thing. Just watch your mind for a minute. Just watching it, you couldn't do it. You entered into your mind. That's not watching your mind. You with me on this? All right, why, now why did I do that exercise? One is just to give you a little sense of fusion. The other is this, is that when we know the principles, we know what we're chasing, we can invent things that are different than are out there. I get that the guy underneath the tree came up with some pretty cool things. You know, Siddhartha was a pretty wise dude. But come on, I mean, don't be telling me Buddhism is a science. It's not, it's not. That's not disrespect. Out of respect for the spaces they explored through the spiritual and mindfulness and religious traditions, I would like to bring Western science into that space and pull it at its joints. Not because we're dirty little boys trying to defile the sacred, but because when you pull it at its joints, you can see ways of entering that space that are things you can put on the factory floor. The people who are doing 10 day silent retreats are the educated elite or young people. They're not people working in the factory floor. And this is the first thing I said to John Kabat-Zinn when I had time to talk to him. I said, here's two problems, just two questions, John. Are you more concerned with the educated elite or are you more concerned with the people on the factory floor? And he said, I'm concerned about everybody. I said, here's the second question. You're more concerned about contemplative practice as a form, or you're more concerned about the processes that it changes? I said, I'm more, he said, I'm more concerned about the processes that changes. I said, you're my pal, I'm with you. We're arm in arm. Anything I can do to support you. But here's the deal. That little exercise in one minute taught you a little bit more than some people get in years of meditation. I get emails from people saying, I didn't really understand what I was doing until I read this book and I realized, oh yeah. Because people can use these forms, these contemplative forms for self-soothing, for escape, for avoidance, they can do that. So now, I think it's cool, why would it, because with meditation you'll notice, like say, follow the breath. You'll notice when you wander off. But the exercise I just did in one minute gets to that same core in a way that's I think a little more because of its imagery, a little more impactful at the pivot point, the exact pivot point, which is fused or not fused. You want to discriminate that pivot point. Does this make sense to you? Does this sound sacrilegious? Am, am, 
Yeah. No, well, not the internal triggers. I don't really care about the specific triggers. I'm going to pinpoint the process. The process that we're targeting is fusion. And if you can catch fusion to fusion, fusion to fusion, fusion to fusion, fusion to fusion, then when you're out there in the world and it's like, oh, this is, a, oh, I'm getting fused again. You can feel it. You can sense it. You can't think it. Your mind can't tell you about it. You can't do a rule about diffusion because you'd have to fuse with a rule to apply the rule and that's already fusion and that's not the point. So, I, I, excuse me for the chest thumping, but I think something like this is so simple and concrete and takes the woo-woo out of it. You don't have to take the woo-woo out of it. If you want to go in and get the Maharishi to give you a mantra, fine. But I would rather have Herb Benson tell me to say the word one. You know, because frankly, I had friends who entered into that whole TM network and all of that. And next thing you know, they were serving breakfast to the Maharishi. That was about bullshit. You know, excuse me. That is sacrilegious. That is, excuse me. I did do it. I did do it. I slipped. But you know, I saw that, look, I shouldn't take the time. I'm on an Eastern religious commune. I'm on the farm. I'm a hippie, right? Swami Kriyananda. Wearing the orange robes. He's dead now. Anybody know Kriyananda? Anyway. Did important work, actually. Good-hearted guy. But I'm literally in the commune room, and one of the uh, members of the commune admits tearfully that she's led the master astray. And a shock goes through the room as one as another, each woman in there said, I thought I led the master astray. I almost ruined the commune, almost lost the Ananda farm, the retreat center, but it just almost fell apart. Because he was nailing every female in the camp. All right? The old dude did it again. 20 years later, almost lost it again. Go put in Wiki, Kriyananda. Uh, what was his name? Walter Matthews. Well, come on. The first exposure I had to Zen meditation was uh, Roshi Joseph, uh, Joseph Sasaki Roshi, one of the most important Zen masters on the planet, who was being, got in trouble at 100 years old for trying to nail his acolytes. Come on, I, no more gurus. <laughs> They're human freaking beings. And so let's, and I learned early on they have feet of clay. So you, you, know, you wonder why the ACBS group is oriented without hierarchy, where, you know, yeah, people know Steve Hayes, but you know a lot of other names because I'm pushing people forward, et cetera, because one decision I made early on, no more gurus, no gurus. We even have, in our, you get a recognized trainer, we even have in the standards, we don't want you to ever say that you're better able to train than other people because you have that recognition. So I'm on a rant. You didn't even ask that. <laughs> but here's, here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. Is that what we're going to do, get centered, Steve. What we're going to do is try to find through Western science the processes that are inside contemplative practice, but not just that, inside things like values and so forth, and come up with things that are as simple as we can possibly get it to teach that process. This example is a very simple one that you can do with anyone to teach the process, the discrimination between fusion and not fusion. And yes, it's the same process that's inside contemplative practice. Other things are too. I'm not saying that's all of it. I'm not saying this is a substitute for meditation. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we need creatively to come up with ways of figuring out what the processes are and then figuring out how to target with procedures. Yeah, okay, and so, but permit me to do the rant because I do want to kind of understand why it's like this. It's not out of disrespect for the, the, the wisdom traditions. It's out of the urgent need to put into our world uh, the essence of it in ways that can reach everybody and being guided by science as to what is the essence of it. Okay, so back to this. You get a sense of what diffusion is? You just had it? 
hundreds of procedures. Once you get it, you can make them up. We and get out of mind in your life. I even asked normal people to make it up, and they send me things from around the world. You know, their T-shirts with their difficult thoughts on it and cool stuff like that. Acceptance is simply once you've reined in the problem-solving mode of mind that fusion leads to, of trying to bring a posture of of open interest in emotion, uh, sensation, perception. So it's. It, and it's acceptance meaning to receive the gift that's offered. That's the original Latin meaning of it. It's still in English when we say, here, will you accept this? And so we're trying to, it's not tolerance, it's not resignation, it's not wallowing. It's noticing, feeling, and being with your own experience. Unconditionally, when it's safe, you know, at the speed that works for you, to open you up to what the content of your experience is and what, uh, what it may contain. These uh, centering processes are flexible attention to the now. It's not just being in the now, because we're always in the now, but flexible attention to the now. Uh, and so we will do things like teach attentional flexibility. I had a a talk yesterday where I was teaching people to notice the soles of their feet, their right foot, their left foot, and then both feet. Um, very much like noticing the breath, actually, but it's a little more concrete. It's actually something that you can use even with children. It's been shown to be able to use with developmentally disabled children and have an unusually strong impact on things like impulsive uh, violence and acting out among developmentally disabled kids, mindfulness for People who have IQs of 60 and so forth is absolutely something you can do by working on attentional flexibility and doing it in a very concrete way. Um, so, you know, we try to catch when people go off into the past or future in a way that's fused. Noticing the past or future in the present is not something that we're going to get rid of. That's fine. Noticing your history and thoughts about your history. Noticing your plans and thoughts about your plans. That's fine, that's happening in the present. But with a sense of distance so that these thoughts are there and not there. And, um, and we're kind of try to do it by catching this dimensionless point of awareness. Now, let me take this a little bit on the RFT side since I did more RFT here. I'm, by giving myself license to take because of time, I now have created a time problem because, uh, because this could go on all day. But um, let me do this a little bit about the bottom. We wanted to figure out what the essence of awareness was. You know, the lab was, our, this tradition has been pretty bold. We want to go all the way down to what is a word, uh, and we went all the way down to what is awareness, what is consciousness. Pretty bold stuff. And the, the thing that we're especially focused on at this bottom, the self as context or observer sense of self or perspective taking sense of self, was to try to go into the experience but then try to figure out what the processes are inside it, these basic cognitive processes. Here's what we discovered. I think you can actually say discovery around it. It was kind of predicted in the earliest work on ACT and RFT, my very first paper in 1984 called Making Sense of Spirituality in the journal Behaviorism of all places. Email me, I'll send it to you, or you can get it on. Anyway, um, we thought it might be composed of, and how we know that it is, of these things called deictic relations. Deictic relations are cognitive relations that include perspective taking for them to work. All right, so let me give you one that you've taught your kids and realized how hard it is to do, here and there. Uh, here and there is hard for kids because they're used to things like being called hums and difference and opposite, that all makes sense. And comparison and before and after, that's easy. But here and there, because like when I'm here, that's there. But when I go there, that's now here, and here is now there. Or my here is your there, but your here is my there. This is like, could you make up your freaking mind? It's hard for kids to do it. Dectic just means by demonstration. The only way that you can do it is by demonstration. And implicit in it is the perspective or point of view of the speaker and listener. A 
okay? Relational framing is social relationships. It's speaker and listener. That's how hum became this. But here and there is a special form of it where you really have to keep track of which side of the social relationship is speaking and listening because at the very same moment, the speakers and listeners have different perspectives. You with me on this? But through demonstration, kids can begin to get it. The same thing with I and you. That's the first one that comes in. It's an easy one, but little kids get confused about that. If you say, what did you eat for, eat, eat for breakfast yesterday? They might say what their sister ate for breakfast yesterday. They're getting it. You're supposed to talk about breakfast, but they don't quite get the I had breakfast part until that's kind of worked out a little bit. I implies you and you implies I. What we mean by I is I in the context of understanding that there's other I's called you. You with me on this? So we have even words like autism, self-ism, right? Autism, that's what it means. Yeah, but it's, it's the I-ness that exists not in the context of you. Autistic spectrum disordered kids, before you do something about it, tend not to have empathy. They have very low perspective taking skills. They don't get. You know, and it, that fear of mind piece that's there before language sometimes is absent. I mean, I mentioned it yesterday, but it's true. Mothers are usually the ones that bring in autistic spectrum disordered kids to the pediatrician, and they usually do it saying something like, there's something wrong, they say, why? I look at my baby, and my baby sees me, but my baby doesn't see me. They can see the reflective nature of consciousness, the I-U-ness. When you see those eyes, you see consciousness there. You're looking at me. No, they don't see that. They see eyes. And they'll learn to respond to the eyes, but it's different. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the mutuality of perspective that allows that, even an infant, to, you know, to give you the toy, which says you want it, versus put it in the box since mom wants to do in cleanup. That's built out by language. Okay, so here's the deal. We learn IU in this flexible, learn it in one, derive it in two way. We learn here, there in that way. And then we learn now, then. That's the last one. And if you've dealt with kids, you know. When data comes home, this is gonna, nah, doesn't mean anything. Time is just not that important until later on. When you finally get IU, here, there, now, then, I hear now and it shows up. It's between three and five and infantile amnesia falls away, and now you have this dimensionless strand on which you can put the beads of memory. You, by the way, it's called infantile amnesia because you now have forgotten. You still have learned it. It's still in your system. You can show in behavioral labs we've done it, but you don't have verbal access to it because you weren't verbal in that way when it happened. You lose what happened in, you know, the songs that my kid could sing by rote when he was two years old, when he was four, couldn't remember. They're gone. Don't you remember, there's two, there's four, there's six, there's eight, shunting trucks and hauling freight, red and green and brown and blue, you know, the Thomas the Train song? No, I don't have no memory of it. But when you go to four, and now you go to even 10 years later, yeah, I remember that, I get it. I mean, you forget some, you see what I'm saying? Because you're now putting your memories in the context of the I here nowness of awareness. But now here's the cool thing about it. I hear nowness also involves you there thenness. Learn it in one, drive it in two. Cognitive I hear now is not autistic I hear now. It's a verbally produced sense of I hear now. It's not analytical and it's not like categorical, it's not judgmental, it's a different side effect of language. Why would that matter? Well, here's one thing that matters. People say, oh, I don't understand this selfless context. It's so hard. I work with my clients. They don't get the observer self, blah, blah, blah. And I say, dude, this is not hard. When you're working with somebody clinically and you want to bring in this sense of the model of the selfless context we're working and we're not getting anywhere, you say something like, why don't we just leave the two of us here right at this moment? Could we do that? Yeah? Okay, come with me. See those two people over there? Doesn't look like they're making a lot of progress. What do you think they should do? You just did that bottom part of the model. You did person, I became you, and you did place. Here became there, okay? Here's another one. We're working, we're bound up. Oh God, Can we just do something? 
If you could just sort of sit there now, I want you to imagine that it's 10 years from now, life has really opened up in a magnificent way, and you're a lot wiser. And really, this moment is now no longer happening. This is in memory. If, if you could pass down something across the 10 years that would help that person called you 10 years ago, who was sitting there in front of this bald guy doing therapy, what might you want to say to him? You get it? Doing time. We could go back, I could take you down to being a little kid. Can we bring, where this started, how old were you? Can we bring that kid in there? Can you picture what you looked like? You remember what was going on inside? If this could really happen, what would you want to say to him? That's the bottom of the model. RFT helps you because it tells you awareness is I, you, here, there, now, then. It's not just being aware. It's aware as a result of a constellation of three cognitive processes coming into one dimensionless. It's dimensionless because now that I can go across time, place, and person, I can put perspective anywhere, everywhere, always. I can imagine what it's like to be in Bangladesh right now. I can imagine what it would be like to be 100 years from now dealing with a planet that is overheating as a result of what we're doing right now. And I can care about that. I can put my consciousness anywhere. And spiritual experiences, this is why that first article, Making Sense of Spirituality, always have a quality of some sort of transcendence around time, place, or person. You just talk to people about spiritual experience that includes oneness, it includes connection, in some way I almost melded, I became, I, I could see, it includes timelessness, and it includes spacelessness. You with me on this? Okay. Now this is not, I'm not trying to say, you know, like, God is the three didactic frames or something. You know, I, I, but when we pull it at its joints and really dig down to the very basic processes, there's now 60 studies or 100 studies on I, you, here, there, now, then, with kids and being able to move it around. I can tell you something clinically that's really cool. If you want to get this more sense of spirituality, could I say that, or, 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 or uh, perspective taking, play around with time, place, and person. And oh, by the way, the clinical traditions have done that forever. Put your mother in the chair. What do you think your mother, or even just what do you think I'm feeling when I hear that? Be as the therapist. You with me on this? All right. This is a funny talk I'm giving. This is very unusual. I'm not, I, you know, I, I just, two, a two hour talk, and it's not two hours, I'm gonna rein it in so I have time for questions. Oh God, I've really created a time problem for myself. The last part of psychological flexibility are values, which is simply now being able to choose the qualities of being and doing that I wanna manifest in my behavior. Choose, what does that mean? It means selecting among alternatives with diffusion. If you get diffusion, then it's easy. It's not lists of pros and cons. It's not figuring it out. It's, I've got lots of thoughts. I've got the, the Oz voice talking about what it is. And I want to be about this in my qualities of being and doing. Why qualities of being and doing? Because it's the only thing that is motivational that's here now. I'm not interested in like, pushing people towards goals and stuff like that. You can have goals inside a values journey. But values journey have this wonderful quality of once I stand and say, love is important. Lovingly, I mean, all values work. If you can't turn it into an adverb, it's not a value from an act point of view. We're not talking goals. We're not talking, I want a million dollars. That's not a value, dude. That's a goal. It could include values. You can do things with money. I'm with you on that. But you can always turn it into an adverb. You can't turn money into an adverb. You can turn love into an adverb. Lovingly, I'll bring my wife the coffee. She, weighs, she likes it even when she was being a jerk last night. <laughs> and that's committed action. I took a marriage vow. I promised I'd be about love 
and commitment and honesty and loyalty all can be turned into adverbs for the rest of my life with you. I promise that. And until you throw me out, it has happened in my life twice. Uh, that's why I'm on my third wife. It has nothing to do with me. All right. Uh, that's psychological flexibility. I know I kind of rushed through that last part, but I want to show you some data. Would you let, is it okay to look at some data and just think about this? I'm going to go back to this earlier part. The earlier part is we're going to process-based therapy. That's where it's coming. That's the train coming down the tracks. The feds are going to make it happen, whether you like it or not. I like it. I don't like brain circuits. I don't think that's going to work. Neurobiological evidence linked with flexibility and all that kind of good, pro yeah, sure, that'll work but you don't get it from just pretty pictures of brains. Uh, the ACT uh, work, you know, has gone, pfft, we're hitting 200 randomized trials, almost 2,000 studies on psychological flexibility, relational frame theory, experiential avoidance. The components of ACT, ACT itself, well, yeah, but this is randomized trials from the night on the carpet, 1981, the first randomized trials, 1986, nothing. My next one is 2002. You're betting like 16, 17 years of your life on something. What I bet on was this moment, that the time would come when processes matter, and we're gonna figure out not just the processes at this highfalutin level of clinical concepts, but we're gonna go all the way down to something that's the verbal cognitive equivalent of reinforcement. I want something that basic. Reinforcement works in any culture. It's that basic. Relational framing works in any language. It's that basic. Turns out, so there's psychological flexibility. We now have 18 studies, different language communities around the world, from indigenous peoples and everything. So that's kind of cool. Um, it's transdiagnostic on steroids because of that. You want to run your business better. You want to be better at sports. You want to play chess better. There's randomized trials on that uh, with ACT. Uh, and anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and being able to learn, and being a better clinician, and on and on and on. And I said, it matters to the therapeutic relationship. Well, that's easy peasy, because therapeutic relationships that work are ones that, where you feel accepted, not judged, the person is present with you consciously, your values matter, and we can be together in ways that serve that. If you just think of about the people who lifted you up in your life, who really profoundly lifted you up in your life, they all have those qualities. Think about it. Did you feel profoundly lifted up by somebody who's constantly judging you? Who doesn't accept you for who you really are? Who's looking at their watch every time they were around you? you know, how, when is this gonna end? Who you couldn't actually sense was conscious there with you? Who would override your values without so much of a second thought and always had to be together in one way, my way, or the highway? I guarantee you, you did not feel empowered and uplifted by relationships like that. With me on this? So now here's the thing. The dirty secret of the common core process people, the Walt Bruce Wampolts of the world, you know, the therapeutic relationship is what matters. I agree. The dirty secret is they can't tell you how to have good ones. I'm sorry, that's not enough. I don't need to know that the relationship is important if you can't tell me how to have good ones. Because it turns out that just caring about the relationship can produce dependency. That's not good. So I can tell you, and we actually have data on it. Here's the data. You take psychological flexibility with your clients, work in alliance measures, they both mediate outcomes in ACT. Mediate meaning they're a functionally important pathway to change. Okay? You allow those two things to compete for variance in what's functionally important, and the relationship falls out. It's no longer significant. And it's no longer significant. Think about it. You, what now? Huh? Yeah, it's gone. It's no longer significant. <laughs> Why? Is that because it's not significant? No. You know this. You get it. It's not hard. If your client doesn't internalize it, it doesn't matter. You get it? If your client doesn't internalize the relationship, the analyst said that they're right. If it's not an internal strength now, you're not going to live with a client. You're only with them an hour a week, maybe. 50 minutes. Yeah, you put acceptance in the room, non-judgment in the room, consciousness in the room, values in the room. If they don't internalize it, 
It doesn't matter. Does this make sense to you? So if I take a measure of internalization, I'm now more accepting of myself, just like we were together in therapy, right? When I said I had this weird sexual thought, the client therapist didn't go, oh my God, I have to leave. I said, you know, if you did that, nothing bad or good is gonna happen with that client. But if you don't, they have to internalize it. If they're going, oh, and still doing the same thing, it's not gonna be any helpful. You with me in this? So the relationship is important because it models, instigates, and supports psychological flexibility. Why is that a better way to say it? In the same way that I, you, here, there, now, then was a better way to say it, because now I can do things linked to the underlying process, I can focus on how to instigate, model, and support greater acceptance, non-judgment, conscious flexible attention to the now linked to your values that create habits of action that are linked to your values in my client. I can do it with my, so here's the model. This is the therapeutic relationship from an act point of view. I'm working on my flexibility. It's hard for me to hear that. You're saying I'm a bad therapist. That's a little hard for me to hear. But don't rescue me. Are you with me on this? And you're targeting those processes and you're doing it with those processes. Like if you ever find yourself saying to a client, you shouldn't be so fused, just shut up. Because you're not gonna go after fusion by doing fusion. You with me on this? It's like the Gandhi message, you don't get peace with war, you get war with war. So, can we, so we have measures that we use with our clients where we ask, did you feel deeply accepted for who you, were, who you are in that session? Did you feel judged by your therapist in that session? We take it at the end of every session. When you come into supervision, we look at the flexibility measures of the space in the therapy. Not of the result on them in terms of flexibility, we measure that too. You see what I'm, what I'm doing? From it, towards it, with it. You put acceptance in the room from the first moment you see your client. Diffusion in the room. So what does your mind say about that? I mean, even in the way you talk about it and the way you hold yourself, the way you talk about yourself and the way you relate to your client, it's diffused, accepting, mindful and values-based, always. And if it's not always, you bring that space to cleaning up the violation of the always. I just noticed I was doing something kind of judgmental there. I apologize for that. My mind hooked me on it, I'm sorry. You with me on this, what we're doing? Does this make sense? I think it gives you a better guide because uh, Bruce, you're wonderful, but tell me how to freaking do it. I can tell you how to do it. Put psychological flexibility in the room, put it in your heart and head, put it in your hands, and then try to put it in people's lives and you'll get empowered therapeutic relationships. I think we're gonna find that psychological flexibility mediates the therapeutic relationship in other forms too. Those data haven't been done. We've done it enough in ACT that we're pretty convinced that it does. What this showed, I'll just tell you what it showed us, is that the processes matter. You can use them as components. You can put them in the lab. But here's what I wanna show you. Okay, I'm gonna only show you this study. That's all. I'm just gonna show you one study out of 20 that I have. This was a study done at UCLA by Michelle Krask, one of the world's best clinical researchers on the planet, in my opinion. Uh, she took her methods, drawn also from Dave Barlow, my mentor, interoceptive exposure, you know, you know, actually deliberately producing body sensations, et cetera, plus exposure, mixed anxiety disorders, or we did exposure with an act space. So exposure was values-based and willingness and acceptance-focused. Okay, you can kind of imagine how you do that. We don't ever do exposure unless there's something you care about that you're trying to do. And your work is wearing on being present and open and diffused while you're doing it, All right? Uh, these are the outcomes on psychological flexibility. Up is good, the way it was scored, down is bad. Uh, ACT does better than CBT. They both move psychological flexibility, but ACT's a little better. These are blind clinical interviews of anxiety symptoms in this 100 and 
30 or so mixed anxiety disorders. Uh, from pre to post, it's identical. From post to follow up, one year later, it's more than a standard deviation larger in ACT. Now think about this. This is her methods with her students done in her shop against our methods with supervision by a graduate student, my gra Jennifer Vlot, calling from 500 miles away. This is like fighting a fight with one hand tied behind your back. Don't be telling me that ACT only works because the proponents are doing the studies. We were willing to do this because I trusted her to do it honestly, and she did. And she published this thing that said, oh, by the way, this method out there beat my method by more than a standard deviation, which is, my method is gold standard. There's nothing better on the planet, CBT plus exposure, nothing better on the planet for missed anxiety disorder, for anxiety disorder, I think. More evidence, more studies. That's cool. But here's what's even cooler, I think. Oh, no, I don't have the slides, but I have to tell you. What's even cooler, I know I'm going late, we now know the moderators. Who are the people that did it better? Two things. If in addition to be anxious, you were also depressed, ACT was really powerful for you. If you just were anxious, CBT was just as good. Get it? I mean, that's cool. That's awesome. Here's another mediator. If you thought you could control your difficult feelings, CBT was better for you. If you came in feeling as though you didn't know how to control your difficult feelings, act was better for you. That's cool. Here's another one. Mediation, we now have 60 mediational studies. When we manipulate psychological flexibility, it's what's functionally important to outcome. Not correlational, it's mediational. I can't afford even three minutes it takes to pull those two apart, and I'm not gonna do the geek stats. But let me just tell you, mediation is the single most important finding for any clinician. Because what it tells you is, the processes you see change reliably are important to outcome. You want to know that, because you can't trust praise from your client. They can praise you for you producing dependency. You can't trust symptom change in your clients, because you can get symptom change suppressively. What can you trust? Healthy processes of change. That's what mediation tells you. We've got more mediational data and act than any other approach, bar none, more consistent, literally more studies, more consistent, more outcomes, and fewer processes. We just have six, or really one, six sides of it. We now know that this effect was mediated by psychological flexibility in both groups. The reason why you got better outcomes, they didn't move the process as much, that's why. Why didn't they move the process as much? They weren't targeting the process. It's not in their theory. That's awesome. I'll let that one study stand for the 25 minutes I was gonna share with you as to why the earlier part mattered. Why the 16 years in the desert of working out processes, not even at the level of flexibility, but all the way down to what is a word and what is awareness and what is consciousness, allows us as a community to stand forward and, and say to you, this work matters and it fits into the zeitgeist of where the field is going. And I predict over time, it's not gonna be act. It's not gonna be act, 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 act. But psychological flexibility has legs, RFT has legs, and when you get into the era of process-based care, you're gonna be in an era in which you have the freedom to do evidence-based care, not by taking you know, protocols and putting them in the head of people that you shoved in the cubby holes inside the DSM, but by reading where the human beings are on processes that liberate them and moving those processes that matter. And that's something that a, vitalize your work as a clinician and is worthy of a human life, uh, the life of a person called a therapist. I hope I've served you and I'll take the five minutes of questions I've allowed. Thank you for staying with me.